Welcome to the sermon podcast for First St. Charles United Methodist Church in downtown St. Charles, Missouri. We are so glad that you're here, and it's our prayer that you feel safe, welcome, and wanted in this space. If you're interested in finding out more about us or supporting our ministries, you can connect with us online at firststcharlesumc.org. Today's scripture comes from the Song of Songs, chapter 2. He brought me to the banqueting house, and his intention toward me was love. In the reading of God's written word, we hear. In the hearing of God's word, we act. In the acting on God's word, it becomes living in our lives. Thanks be to God. Heard it in a love song, can't be wrong or so the Marshall Tucker Band claimed. Do you ever remember ever hearing today's scripture? I do. I heard it in a love song, a vacation Bible school love song. I even remember the hand movements they taught us as kids. I am his and he is mine. His banner over me is love. On the surface, it sounds rather harmless, cute even, when the kids did it. I remember, too, another experience that I had with this same scripture and the melody attached to it. It was years later, after I had been in ministry for a while, I found myself into a forced communion situation led by clowns. Now, I'm not making fun of the clergy. They were literal clowns with wigs, white makeup, baggy pants, oversized shoes, red lipstick, and a round red nose. And I don't want to trigger anyone who may suffer from coulophobia or fear of clowns, but they were real clowns. And as they were leading in communion, they had a singing I am his and he is mine. His banner over me is love. It was a surreal scene I could never make up. And it made me kind of want to throw up, at least a little, knowing as I did by then the real context of the song and the scripture on which it's based. Today we continue our series learning to read the Bible again, we're looking at some of the various types of literature throughout Scripture to see what we can learn for our living and loving here today. Today's Scripture comes from a book that is singularly unique in all of Scripture. In fact, I'd be willing to bet that you've never in your lives sat through a Sunday school lesson, much less a sermon on this part of the Bible. Maybe a random wedding homily, but that's all. So great is our discomfort with it that the Puritan in us would have us conveniently overlook it. And the challenge I've set for myself and for all of us is to deal with it honestly, with integrity, without devolving into the kind of talk that I remember from a middle school locker room. Have I sufficiently picked your interest? Today's scripture comes from a book called The Song of Songs, or sometimes called The Canticle, or sometimes known as The Song of Solomon. For years, people attributed the book to Solomon, what with his 700 wives and 300 concubines? Most scholars now think not. With the dating of it all over the map, anywhere from the 10th to the 2nd century BCE, my own dating would place it somewhere around the 3rd century before Christ. What it is, the the whole book, is a love poem or a song. More explicitly, it's an erotic piece that, if made into a movie, would easily be rated NC-17, clearly adult. 
In our canons, it comes right after Proverbs and Ecclesiastes as the last of the wisdom literature. One could wonder what wisdom ever thought it should be included in Scripture. Here's a PG sampling that we've run through the filtering scripture, filtering filter of every last one of our clergy to show that it would be okay to share today. Chapter 1, verse 15. Behold, thou art fair, my love. Behold, thou art fair. Thou hast dove's eyes. My beloved spake and said unto me, Rise up, my love, my fair one, and come away. For lo, the winter is past. The rain is over and gone. The flowers appear on the earth. The time of the singing of the birds is come. And the voice of the turtle is heard in our land. The fig tree putteth forth her green figs, and the vines, the tender grape, give a good smell. Arise, my love, my fair one, and come away in the secret places of the stairs. Let me see thy countenance, for thy countenance is comely. My beloved is mine, and I am his. He feedeth among the lilies. Behold, thou art fair, my love. Behold, thou art fair. Thou hast dove's eyes within thy locks, Thy hair is like a flock of goats that appear on Mount Gilead. Thy teeth are like a flock of sheep that are even shorn. Thou art fair, my love. There is no spot in thee. I am come into my garden, my sister, my spouse. I have gathered my myrrh and with my spice. I have eaten my honeycomb with my honey. His mouth is most sweet yea he is altogether lovely this is my beloved and this is my friend some of you may know this one because of the lyrics of a contemporary christian hymn here i am to worship and its line altogether lovely and then set me as a seal upon thy heart as a seal upon thine arm for love is as strong as death. Jealousy is cruel as the grave. The coals thereof are coals of fire, which hath a most vehement flame. Many waters cannot quench love, neither can the floods drown it. If a man would give all the substance of his house for love, it would surely be scorned. Because of the songs sizzling sensuality there are some who would argue for this book's banning not just from schools but from the Bible and if you want even more reasons to overlook this book there's not one single mention of God or the nation Israel or the law or sin or the mighty acts of God in salvation not one of the Bible's other big themes are there. It's like in the heat of passion, all those things are forgotten. It's all about our very real human feelings and desires and passions. It's about love. It's all about love. Maybe you won't be surprised then that both Jewish and Christian interpreters have chosen not to take the book literally, interpreting the poetry instead as an allegory of God and Israel, in the case of our Jewish friends, or God and the church in Christian interpretation. This was especially true for the medieval mystics for whom it brought both light and heat in the cold of the dark ages. How do we become one with Christ? That was their question. Their conclusion, the closest comparison that we have is in the intimacy between two consenting adults. 
for the last 50 years, interpreters have gone in a different and, I think, very helpful direction. For starters, they point out that this book provides a healthy corrective to those who would proffer a disembodied spirituality. For the Hebrew people, there was never such a thing as a soul separated from a body. There was never such a thing as a disembodied self. A soul was, is, a living, breathing body. Our bodies, our passions, they are a spiritual gift from God, pure and simple. They're not to be suppressed or repressed. Human sexuality is a cause for celebration. It follows that our God-given sexuality is for more than procreation. Human love is beautiful and gifted to us. God takes pleasure in our pleasure. That's one takeaway. Going further, there's one interpreter who's had enormous influence on the rest of us, pointing out that the location of the rendezvous of the two lovers is that of a garden, perhaps contrasting with the Garden of Eden. Whereas in Genesis' garden, the woman might appear passive. Here she is every bit her lover's equal. Love, at its biblical best, is a mutual meeting of equals. I am his, and he is mine. Egalitarian in its essence. And while there is a mutuality to the love, to be certain, the woman in this song is every bit the protagonist, taking initiative, thinking and acting for herself and her feelings and her desires. She is in no way passive or demure. She is assertive. Did she ever hear the poem, What Are Little Boys Made Of? Snips and snails and puppy dog tails. That's what little boys are made of. What are little girls made of? Sugar and spice and everything nice. That's what little girls are made of. To that, the Song of Songs says, Nah, I don't think so. Any stereotype box you want to put her in, for the sake of love, our heroine will bust through. And that leads me to what I think are the lessons and takeaways for everyone in this book. Perhaps for parents most of all. What is it that you want to teach your daughters or granddaughters about who God created them to be? Almost as truly, what do you want to teach your sons and grandsons about the women in their lives? What can all persons, regardless of gender, take from this seductive song? Here are my three takeaways. You can find your own. These are mine. First, despite what some might say, a woman's body is her own to choose when she wants to say no and when she wants to say yes. Centuries later, Jesus would say, let your yes be yes and your no be no. We all have the right to determine what goes on with our bodies. Male, female, gay, straight, transgendered. We all deserve this much. The woman in today's song, knows this. Second, she's not subservient, but is an equal to any man. She can be assertive or not. Her choice and hers alone. 
She deserves to be treated well. The only ground on which she must relate is equal ground. And then third, human love, when seen on these terms, is a beautiful gift of God. I know that in saying this, I'm reading God back into this story, and that's exactly what our text doesn't do. However, by placing this book in our Bibles, the persons who made that decision made a huge statement. They're saying that the sacred sings the secular and is not separated from it, such that the sacred is not subsumed in the sacralized. There I go sounding like a dang theologian. Let me put it more plainly. By its placement in our Bibles, the Song of Songs says, there is no division between the sacred and the secular. That's a made-up division that'll be the death of us. Instead, it's all sacred. It's all of God. And in a case that Genesis most certainly got right. God looked upon creation and said, it is good. May God so look on all our lives, even the most intimate parts, and say, it is good. May each of us be so blessed. Now, feel free to go home and read all eight unedited chapters for yourself.